Okay, sorry for the delay, but I'm here with Jenga. Jenga, uh, introduce yourself to the stream. Hello, guys. Uh, well, you obviously said my name, so there's not much to introduce. But obviously, t to those who are familiar with us, we'll be going over the refutations of Craig Trilly's video concerning Duong, which is a very humble fellow who made a very good a uh, collection of videos on his YouTube channel presenting a great case from history and scripture concerning the Philippe and the errors of the Eastern Orthodox. Now, before we start, obviously, as in all things, apologetics is tied with virtue and the spiritual life, as we do not separate the two. So we'll start by praying a Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, bendita tu meribus, e benedictus fructus ventris tu Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nos peccatoribus, nunc in tenora mortis nostre. Amen. Amen. Now, my friend, would you like to start the video? Yeah, let me just uh, get it over with real quick. I'm trying to... Uh, I'm not sure why, but... My browser is acting up right now. I'm gonna wait, take your time. Problem. Wh who's here in the stream right now? I'll type, oh, there's only three people, but I know like this will surface around. Um. Or yeah, I, I just got YouTube to work. All right. You guys ready? Go ahead, my friend. Second. So why, but it's like, I got it right here. All right. Perfect. It's time to present. Share. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, you can see it. All right. Give me a second. Let me let me pull up the chat on my laptop. Make sure everyone's. We should probably do this in two parts. This is a long video. Yeah. Give me a second. We'll do part two tomorrow. All right. And it seems. All right. All right. So so we're gonna start now. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Trulia. And today we're doing that the church fathers did not teach the filioque in response to Duan. Wait, can you guys hear the video? Uh, can you hear the video, Django? Yeah, I can hear it perfectly. Could could people in the audience hear the video? Just so, you know, type like a thumbs up or something. Got to make sure. All right, all right they're here. Uh, oh, perfect. really think he did a good job with this video. I'm surprised. I'm not aware of any real substantive responses. Uh, he sought to answer the question through the consensus of the saints, which is how we ought to be doing theology. Uh, he defines his terms. He does some of his own philosophizing. So he really tries to go at it. And I think it's a fun and good production. And so I want to say that from the onset. But from a content standpoint, it comes across as quote mining. I personally... <laughs> I saw that coming. Uh, infer, doesn't mean I'm right. I'm not God, but I infer that he did not read the entire text that he's quoting and philosophizing, and making inferences from. And even sometimes he didn't even read the paragraphs in which these texts are lifted from. At least that's how it seems to me. So in this presentation, I'm going to cover the first three examples he uses. All right. And in those first three examples, um, I want to show the significance of Duong getting every single proof text he covers wrong. And mm. if he gets every single proof text wrong in his first three examples, it's a good sampling of what the entirety of his work offers. And then after that, we'll cover 
uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria and St. Maximus, and we'll try to wrap this whole thing together, show a consistent thread between everything. All right. Uh, so thing. that be Yeah, so we're going to do the first part. These three samples in which he claims Duong was in error, somehow not credible. And then the second part, we're going to go over uh, St. Cyril and then St. Maximus. All right. You continue being said, let's uh, go to the next slide. We're going to talk about St. Augustine first. Now, Duong quotes Tractate 99, Paragraph 4 in the Gospel of John, because when juxtaposed with his own private interpretations, it teaches the filioque. Mm -hmm. Now, Duong right. cites the following. It states, accordingly, he shall not... All right, let's, let's read it a little bit. Uh to you know get some nuance before he no, does okay. uh, let, let him read it first and then we can go to check it speak of himself because he is not of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak he shall hear of him from whom he proceeds to him hearing is knowing but knowing is being as has been discussed above because then he is not of himself, but of him from whom he proceeds, and of whom he has essence, and of him he has knowledge. From him, therefore, he has hearing, which is nothing else than knowledge. Now, according to his personal interpretation, we could see of John 16, 13 to 15, Duong says that this passage indicates that the Spirit acquires hearing from the Son, something he does not actually say, by the way, but presuming this, Duong does, that this means that it's from the Son, he, the Spirit, has essence because he has hearing from him. However, Duong's take on Augustine is wrong because he seems to interpret quotes in isolation, juxtaposing his own logic onto the text instead of that posed by the author in the same work. As we shall see, this is an interpretive error Duong regrettably makes repeatedly effectively turning almost any text into a pro-Florentine filioque text. In other words, his interpretive methodology is a transparent partisan eisegesis. The interpretive methodology I put forward is understanding a text according to its own terms and the logic the author is actually expounding. So let's try taking Augustine at his word and reading the work in context with itself without inserting Duong's exegesis of John 16 onto the text. When we look earlier at the same paragraph at Tractate 99, Augustine's actual point is that the properties like life, light, and hearing pertain to the divine essence, so they are references to causality from the Father. As per Augustine, we're going to see... Augustine says this earlier in that paragraph. When, therefore, it is said of the Holy Spirit, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that he shall speak, so much the more is this true of a simple nature, which is simple, uncompounded, in the truest sense, to be either understood or believed, which in its extent and sublimity far surpasses the nature of our minds. For there is mutability in our mind, which comes by learning to the perception of what it was previously ignorant of. And so that substance, the human mind, is not in the truest sense simple, to which being is not identical with knowing, for it can exist without the possession of knowledge. But it cannot be so with that divine substance, for it is what it has. Augustine continues, and on this account, it has not knowledge in any such way as that the knowledge whereby it knows should be to it one thing, and the essence whereby it exists another, but both are one, nor ought that to be called both, which is simply one, as the Father has life in himself, and he himself is not something different from the life that is in him. So has he given to the Son to have life in himself, that is, has begotten the Son, that he also should have himself be the life. Accordingly, we ought to accept, next paragraph, I mean, next slide, my apologies, same paragraph. Accordingly, we ought to accept what is said of the Holy Spirit, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, in such a way as to understand thereby that he is not of himself, because it is the Father only who is not of another. 
For the Son is born of the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, but the Father is neither born of nor proceeds from another. So, in short, Augustine's point, whether you agree with it or not, is that a simple essence or substance is and must be identical with what it has, knowledge, love, life, etc. This applies to hypostatic causality in that when the scriptures teach an attribute of the Father, such as life, is given to another divine hypostasis, this therefore pertains to the hypostatic causality of the hypostasis of the Son or Spirit from the Father. That is Augustine's whole point in this section. Now, Augustine continues. Yeah, let's this stop is right in the there. same paragraph. That is sufficient. So it's actually very interesting there, unironically, that he just read an entire section of St. Augustine teaching quite like what we would say is absolute divine simplicity. <laughs> right? I mean, he read it right there. Uh, whatever uh, God has, he yes. is, according to St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. And so it's ironic that he's even contesting this opinion of St. Augustine when St. Augustine quotes John 16, 13, which is a direct quote of Jesus saying, whatever the spirit shall hear, it's quite literally from Christ. He will not mm -hmm. do it of his own, but what he shall hear. And he actually says this is not even reference to an economic procession, but Augustine ties this in with a sensual procession. Or notional procession, that which is the communication of divine essence, right. which is beautiful. So then, if that's the case, then the whole passage, John 16, 13 to 15, according to Augustine, must be read in light of communication of the essence. Right. Because he also mentions that uh, St. Augustine uh, brings up that, for example, knowledge, life, etc., and here is in the substance. Um, and in the passage, he's talking about how these things are identical with the substance, which, again, uh, corresponds to your point that he's talking about ADS. But if he's talking about things which inhere in the substance, then he can be talking about um, things which are really distinct f from the substance. And uh, that would be through energetic manifestation or energetic procession. Correct. You got it. <laughs> so it seems as if, yeah, he, he actually is speaking about communication of the substance, not of the essence. It's beautiful. Uh, let, let Craig finish whatever point he's trying to make. And yet, surely, there should not on that account occur to human thought any idea of disparity in the Supreme Trinity, for both the Son is equal to him of whom he is born, and the Holy Spirit to him from whom he proceeds. But what difference there is in such a case between proceeding and being born would be too lengthy to make the subject of inquiry and dissertation. Accordingly, he shall not speak of himself, because he is not of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He shall hear of him from whom he proceeds. To him hear it is knowing, but knowing is being, as has been discussed above. Right? We just read everything leading up to the part that Dwag is now quoting. Because then he is not of himself, but of him from whom he proceeds, and of whom he has essence, of him he has knowledge. From him, therefore, he has hearing, which is nothing else than knowledge. Following the logic of the passage, the spirit is of the Father, or he would not have knowledge. Therefore, his essence is of the Father. Augustine at no point applies his logic to the spirit being caused by the Son. In short, I mean, th didn't Craig just say that knowledge inheres in the substance, or that Augustine yeah. said that knowledge <clears throat> and substance are the same in the previous passages? So now it's not about communication of the essence. Hmm. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> yeah, th that must be the case. But what's interesting here, because I read a little bit of Tract 899 while Craig was speaking. In paragraph 6 of the same Tract Day, St. Augustine then inquires uh, this question. I'm going to quote him directly. Quote, Someone may here inquire where the Holy Spirit proceeds also from the Son. For the Son is of the Father alone, and the Father is of the Son alone. But the Holy Spirit is not the spirit of one of them, but of both. You have the Lord saying, For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your Father that speaks in you. And you have the apostle that says, quote, Has sent forth the spirit of his Son in your hearts. Are there then two, the one of the Father, the other Son? Certainly not, for there is one body, he said. And referring to the church and presently added, and one spirit. And then he continues, 
He himself says the spirit of the Father that dwells in you, and the apostle declares, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts. And he ties this in at the end, which he says, and many other testimonies there are which plainly show that he who is in Trinity is styled the Holy Spirit is a spirit both of the Father and of the Son. <laughs> so he's pretty clear, actually. Yeah, very, right? very beautiful. Yeah, I mean, to be completely honest with you, um, I don't even know why he's even tussling when it comes to Saint Augustine. Like, I don't understand. Like, 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 not even any father in in any regard, to be honest, because every father's pretty explicit on on what they mean. But Saint Augustine, especially any Latin father, was very precise because they use Latin terminology, uh, to yeah, to, to kind of to uh, to kind of explicate on, on their doctrines. Um, so it's kind of weird how he's using Track Day ninety nine to try to, you know get out of the the issue i guess but exactly. it isn't really working now the only only the way i can see craig truly respond to this is saying oh when he's saying that the holy spirit proceeds also from the sun he's just talking economically because those verses may be interpreted economically of course right but he then says in chapter eight because i also read this he says this if then the holy spirit proceeds both from the father and from the son why does the son say he proceeds from father john fifteen twenty six. why do you think but just because it is to him, I the Father, he is wont to attribute even that which is his own, of whom he himself also is. Hence we have him, I the Son, saying, My doctrine is not mine, but him that sent me. If therefore in such a passage we are to understand that as his doctrine, which nevertheless is declared not to be his own, but the Father's, how much more in that other passage are we to understand the Holy Spirit as proceeding from the Son, where his words, quote, he proceeds from the Father were uttered so as not to imply he proceeds not from me, but from him, of whom the Son has it that he that he is God. He certainly has it that from him also the Holy Spirit proceeds. And in this way, the Holy Spirit has it of the Father himself that he should also proceed from the Son, <laughs> even as he proceeds from the Father. Wow. That is yeah, and weird. how And how does the Son proceed from the Father? The, the Eastern Orthodox say through communication of essence. Therefore, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the sun in regards to communication of essence as well it's, it's very simple very simple to just read the passages <laughs> it's definitely not just the like individual interpretation of duong like people have been interpreting or kind of getting it right for years i mean they they got it right at the council of florence pretty much right i mean there practically there's a consensus of scholarship that demonstrates that saint augustine was practically the principle by which the entire West followed after his theology and Trinity. Augustine's Trinity in the West is dogmatic. And his the Trinitate has been read in multiple places and has been followed by Boethius, Fulgentius of Ruspe, Pope Gregory, Isidore, the the Trullo Synods, I mean the um, Toledo Synods, etc. and so forth. Hmm, but so, yeah, so far. Oh, he hasn't really given an adequate response, but let's see what else he has to say. The interpretation Duong poses actually contradicts the point Augustine makes, which is why Duong juxtaposes his own interpretation of John 16 onto what Augustine is actually saying. Without transparently inserting his own interpretation of John 16 into it, which is what we generally call eisegesis, his point does not work. To be fair, my guess is that Duong is not being duplicitous in the least bit. He probably never read the rest of the passage and simply used a quote from a quote mic. Yeah, but this is why it is dangerous. <laughs> wow, wow, what? Yeah, what hypocrisy! Wow. <laughs> honestly, I, honestly, I think Craig Troy, he can be honest sometimes in his articles. Sometimes he. He's lenient. Sometimes he, he he certainly like gives the position to the Catholics. He might admit some things here and there, but wow, this is quite hypocrit hypocritical or some great hypocrisy. Because if you just read two chapters later, Saint Augustine just says the same concerning the question of the Son's procession. I mean, the Holy Spirit's procession from the Son. Yeah, he, he just got that from a quote, man, supposedly. <laughs> I mean, will Craig truly? I mean, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll retract that statement. Does Craig truly then address two chapters later? 
Well, no, as we know, he doesn't. He doesn't address it simply because Craig Truly, he himself, who talks about context and Duong apparently taking things out of context, has not read the context of Augustine himself. It's very unfortunate. And and the ironic part is like on a lot of spaces and and this is even uh cited in Duong's video, ironically speaking. Uh, in a lot of community posts, he usually concedes with the Latin interpretations, and he concedes that the Latin interpretations of the text uh, are, pro are problematic to the Orthodox. And uh, pertaining to St. Hilary, uh, he thinks that St. Hilary uses Octor as the, uh, the uh, spirit's uh, origin. Um, so I'm not sure if he changed his positions or... You know, but he he does concede in, in multiple areas that the Latin interpretation, specifically of the Latin fathers, uh, are pro are problematic to the Orthodox, and, and and he himself admits this numerous times. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure what he's trying to do in this video, but let's see what else he has to say. Chris, right. to just read quote minds, presume one understands what the point is from a short excerpt, and then distort the meaning of a passage by imposing one's own logic. So now let's talk about on the Trinity. <clears throat> now, Duan quotes Book 5, Chapter 15. It must be admitted, says Augustine, that the Father and the Son are a beginning of the Holy Spirit, not two beginnings, but as the Father and Son are one God and one Creator and one war Lord relatively to the creature. Everyone kind of forgets that part, relatively to the creature. So are they one beginning relatively to the Holy Spirit? But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one beginning in respect to the creature as also one creator and one God on the Trinity Book 5, paragraph 15. His, his conclusion from the preceding essentially is, it sounds like Florence, so it must be Florence. However, read the very sentences preceding this in the paragraph, something mm. very important when interpreting these works. Let's see. Augustine says, therefore, the spirit is both the spirit of God who gave him and ours who have received him, not indeed that spirit of ours by which we are, because that is the spirit of a man which is in him. But this spirit is ours in another mode that in which we also say, give us this day our bread. Although certainly we have received that spirit also, which is called the spirit of a man. So obviously what we're reading here is about the temporal procession to man, the energetic procession. You can see the context is not about the eternal origin of So true. He said the energetic procession. I mean, literally, like, you you just read Tract A99 and the paragraph that literally debunks that entire presupposition, literally. Like, it, you literally read where he speaks about God ad intra as opposed to God at extra, which would be economic procession. So I have, like, I honestly have no idea. Yeah. Where... I've read the Trinitate quite a few times. Um, if you just read literally the next chapter, not even, you don't have to read chapter 14. You can just read chapter 13. Augustine's here clearly referring to the eternal relations, right? Why don't we just read chapter 14, since he said, just look at the preceding context. So if you read the beginning of chapter four, uh, 14, he says this. <clears throat> but in their mutual relation to one another and the Trinity itself, if the begetter is a beginning in relation to that which he begets, the Father a beginning in relation to the Son, because he begets him. But where the Father is also beginning in relation to the Holy Spirit, since it said he proceeds from Father, there's no so, small question. Because if it is so, he will not only be beginning to that thing which he begets or make, but also to that which he gives. And here, too, that question comes to light, as it can, which is one to trouble many, why the Holy Spirit is not also Son, since he, too, comes forth from the Father, as read in the Gospel. For the Spirit came forth, not as born, but as given. And so he is not called a Son, because he was neither born as the only begotten, nor made, so that by the grace of God he might be born to adoption. For that which is born of the Father is referred to the Father only when called Son, and so the Son is the Son of the Father, and not also our Son. But that which is given is referred both to him who gave and to those to whom he gave. And so the Holy Spirit is not only the Spirit of the Father and of the Son who gave him, but he is also called ours who have received them. Wow. How clear. Very explicit. Very, very explicit. Very explicit.
Let's see what else he has to say regarding energetic manifestation. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but Augustine continues. All right. Yeah, please read them. <laughs> For what have you, he says, which you did not receive? But what is one thing which we have received that we might be? Another that which we have received that we might be holy. Whence it is also written of John that he came in the spirit and power of Elias. And by the spirit of Elias is meant the Holy Spirit, whom Elias received. Mm -hmm. So obviously, it's this is still about the temporal procession. Augustine continues. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. And the same thing is to be said of Moses when the Lord says to him, and I will take of your spirit and will put it upon them. That is, I will give to them of the Holy Spirit, which I have already given to you. If therefore that also which is given, the spirit has him, Jesus, for a beginning by whom it, the spirit, is given, since it, the spirit, has received from no other source that which proceeds from him, the son. Do you notice, by the way, before like uh, the uh, other two quotes that uh, Craig gave is specifically of creatures receiving from the Spirit? Mm -hmm. I think that, that's very important because one is indeed speaking of ad extra because it's creatures receiving from the Spirit, but the Holy Spirit receiving from the Son is a different story because the Son is not a creature. That, that's actually very heretical. If, right. If, if the spirit is receiving from the son, then that entails an, an ad intra procession. And even yeah. uh, Phocius and his mystagogy admits that and he denies that the spirit receives from the son in any sense because this would entail a, a procession. Of course. So I think what Craig is essentially missing here about Augustine's point, and of course this is the case because he's never read the De Trinitate of Augustine, is that Augustine's fundamental belief here in basically conflating the, the temporal and eternal procession is that he believes for the exact reason that the Son economically, economically perceives the Spirit is that this relates to the eternal notional procession of the Son's subsistence from the Son and the Father. This is why he says once again in the following chapter that the Holy Spirit not, is not only given from the Father, but also the son, as we'll read again. He says this. <clears throat> right here. Oops, I lost it. Huh. <laughs> I actually lost it. I didn't have it prepared. That's fine. Do you, do you, you want to uh, try reading or you want to keep on going? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just read it right here. <clears throat> So he says this, but if asked further whether as a son by being born has not only this, that he is a son, but that he is absolutely and so also the Holy Spirit by being given has not only this. So basically his question is whether Holy Spirit is another son, because if the father gives the spirit and he also gives the son, how is the Holy Spirit not also another son? So he says this, by being given had not only this, that he is given, but that he is absolutely whether therefore he, he had or therefore he was before he was given, but was not yet a gift. Or whether for the very reason that God was about to give him, I the spirit, he was already a gift also before he was given. But if he does not proceed unless when he is given, and surely cannot proceed before there was one to whom he might be given, how in the case was he in his very substance, if he's not unless because he is given? Just as a son by being born not only has this, that he's a son which is said relatively, I by relation, but his very substance absolutely, so that he is. Does the Holy Spirit also precede always and precede not at time? Oops, I think I got the wrong part. Forgive me, Philly, if you do see this video. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really gotta find it. No, I it's just read it. We'll we'll post it in the in the comments if anything. Yeah, I'll just read it and post it in the comments. <laughs> but regardless. <laughs> It was recorded. Craig might have heard me the first time. He could rewind it. It's not that hard. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's keep on going. So clearly, the Spirit has the Son as beginning in reference to his temporal sending forth to mankind. That is the context. Again, it doesn't follow, like I said before, because of the fact that we see that in the case before in the passages of saint augustine he's specifically speaking about receiving and reference a creature the son is not a creature uh therefore it does not follow because 
it clearly by by the paragraphs that Django read, um, he's specifically speaking about receiving in an ad intra sense. Um, do do you have anything to add? Nope, I think that's pretty sufficient. Let truly finish the point. Augustine continues. It must be admitted that the Father and Son are a beginning of the Holy Spirit, not two beginnings. But as the Father and Son are one God and one Creator and one Lord, relatively to the creature, right? Because it's not the temporal procession. So are they oh, sure. one beginning relatively to the Holy Spirit? But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one beginning in respect to the creature, as also one Creator and one God. All right. And so we can see the context of what Duan quoted. Now, when Duan shows up to the party with the these uh, fine lads and girls right here, boasting, book uh, five, paragraph 15 of On the Trinity, allegedly proves Augustine believed that the Father and the Son are both the eternal origin of the Spirit. Anyone who has actually read the whole paragraph cannot help but look back at him like, really? Like, you know, these people here? Eternal origins are not even remotely the topic of discussion. Interestingly, there is a section Augustine actually gives a specific judgment oh, on the question oh, of eternal yeah. origins and on the Trinity. Yeah, it is book fun. four, chapter. Huh? That's that's why I quoted that number. Yes, stop right there. So now I remember why I quoted that part because you. Do you have the opened? Sorry, said again. You were or, lagging. Yeah, my bad. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so this is the reason why I quoted it, actually. is because he was saying this giving in chapter 14 is referring only to a temporal or economic procession. But in chapter 15, just right after that, he quietly says this is referring to eternal procession. Does the Holy Spirit proceed always and proceed not in time but from eternity? But because he is also perceived that he was capable of being given, was already a gift even before there is one whom he might be given. For there's there's a meaning between a gift and a thing that has been given. For a gift may exist even before it is given, but it cannot be called a thing that which has been given unless it has been given. So he says this is actually eternal, quite literally. So when he speaks of the Holy Spirit being of the creature, right, he's referring here to like the temporal procession or the grace that is given in time. But he also says that this relation of being a gift is eternal. And he says this is in relation to the Father and the Son, as we read in the end of chapter 14, which is very important to know. This is why in the beginning of chapter 15, he then speaks of the eternal relation of the, the Son with the Father, in which the Son is given by the Father. And then he speaks of the Holy Spirit as the gift of both. Amen. All right, is that all? Yep, go ahead. Very base, very, very beautiful and concise. 29, Augustine says the following. Because also when he had said, whom the Father will send, he added also in my name. Yet he did not say, whom the Father will send for me, as he said, whom I will send unto you from the Father, showing namely that the Father is the beginning, principium <laughs> of the whole divinity. Or if it is better on. so expressed, deity. He, therefore, who proceeds from the Father and from the Son is referred mm -hmm. back to him from whom the Son was born. Okay. It is should it should be noted, by the way, that oh, the Council of Florence, don't tell me he's quoted actually... by Duong, states the Father and Son as from one principium and from one okay. cause. Wait. Augustine literally contradicts Florence. Dude. What? That's, what? <laughs> that's in line with Florence. What? One is talking about a principle of spiration. The other one is talking about in reference to the Father being the origin of the Trinity. How is that a contradiction? That is not a contradiction. He just doesn't understand her theology. Actually, what Augustine just said there in a quote is exactly what Florence says. Florence says that the Father is the source of the Son and the Spirit. That is which, not contrary to our theology. Which uh, which uh, session? So perhaps we could put it in the comments after. Yeah, of course. I have it in my notes. Let me guess again.
Yeah, don't don't worry about it, cause we're just gonna put in the comments anyways. But yeah, uh, this doesn't contradict. Uh, uh, Saint Augustine isn't contradicting Florence here because Florence is speaking about principle aspiration. There's one principle aspiration, um, and on the on and on the Trinity. Uh, even if you open Saint Thomas and and Summa Theologica, he very explicitly says that the Father is the principle of the Godhead insofar as he's the origin of the Godhead, right? Because the father is not, uh, doesn't proceed, um, nor is he spirated either. So in reference to him not proceeding or being spirated or him not being affiliation or procession, but of him being the ultimate source, he is the principle of the whole divinity. Indeed, this doesn't entail though that he is the only principle of spiration as St. Augustine says multiple times in, in his other works whenever he adduces from John 16. He says that John that uh John 16 entails that the father communicates by to the son. And if you read Duong's video, he goes over that very adequately. So actually very uh, I I question whether uh Craig actually read I mean not read watched uh Duong's video uh, honestly, to be honest with you, because <laughs> if anything, Duong goes over the arguments he's pre presenting. Also, here's the excerpt from Florence, right? This is what Florence says. The Latins assert that they say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, not with the intention of excluding the Father from being the source and principium of all deity, <laughs> that is the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's direct words of Florence. So no, this doesn't, St. Augustine is not contradicting Florence. Florence actually says just exactly that. Yeah. Very, very Florence is just Augustine at a council. <laughs> <laughs> Augustine will literally affirm everything it's saying, ironically. And, uh, what else does he say? Florence, the father, not the father and son, is the whole divinity's principium. Quoting Augustine. The Spirit's origin, in Gustin's words, is referred back to him, the Father, from whom the Son was born. Eternal origins are clearly the point at issue here. Zhuang's misapprehension of Augustine's appointment, the term principium, seems to come from an incomplete reading. At this point, I can end my treatment of Augustine, because Zhuang's treatment doesn't go any further. How yeah, this is a very, uh, yeah, so you can say, yeah, this is a very disappointing ending of Augustine here. I mean, nah. I was expecting something crazy from Eastern Orthodox theology, um, but at, at the same time, I'm not surprised because you really cannot uh, debunk truth uh, at the end of the day. You really can't. I don't know what, I've met you very disappointed, Craig Trilly here. I was not expecting this from him. At all, this is like a monkey level. Who <laughs> type of reputation? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> oh my! However, I want to dig deeper as I think Augustine unlocks for us the, uh, the Orthodox doctrine of the Spirit's procession really? in a way only a few saints have truly appreciated. Now, let's consider the anti Arian work responses to Maximinius. Now, guys, put on your thinking caps now. Therein Augustine likewise that. makes an explicit observation concerning the Father being the Spirit's eternal cause, but in so, in so doing brings the filioque into view. So let's now put that on screen. All right, so now he's going to move on to Maximus, which Maximus does teach the filioque. Oh, no, he's this is referring to another of Augustine's works, which is against the Arian Maximus. Oh, oh, ma oh ma yeah, it says response to yeah, Maximus. Yeah, yeah. All right, my, my, my bad. Let's see what he has to say. In response to Max Minus, book two, chapter 14, verse one, Augustine writes, the son comes from the father. The Holy Spirit comes from the father. The former is born. The latter proceeds. Hence, the former is the son of the father from whom he is born. But the latter is the spirit of both because he proceeds from both. When the Son spoke of the Spirit, he said he proceeds from the Father, because the Father is the author, or in Latin that literally means it's author, which means originator, of his procession. The Father begot a Son, and by begetting him, gave it to him that the Holy Spirit proceeds from him as well. 
Wow. So I could already see. Um, very clear. Once again, I want to see how Craig responds to us. Hmm. The, the objection. Augustine says the spirit proceeds from the sun as well. Well, to answer this objection, I'd respond that Augustine is likely referencing the temporal procession here because he literally <laughs> identifies the father as the octor or originator of the eternal procession. While inferring primary and secondary causes, as I'm sure Duong would do, is theoretically possible for reasons I will soon cover, such inferences are without justification. But how about another passage? In fact, the strongest one that can be posed in favor of Florence's perspective. Duong fails to mention it, but it's in Book 15, Paragraph 47 of On the Trinity, where Augustine states that the procession from both without any changeableness of nature gives the Holy Spirit essence without beginning of time. The proceeding sounds like the Holy Spirit derives his essential existence in eternity past from both the Father and the Son. This, contrary to Augustine's own explicit written statements on the topic, appears to delineate that the Father and Son are essentially the Spirit's cause. So, oh no, Duong wins! Yeah. Well, no, first hmm. because he never brought it up, this would oh. be me beating myself. Oh. So, he wouldn't be winning. But how is it Augustine literally, all right, saying that the procession from both, to quote him, the Father and Son, literally gives to the Holy Spirit essence in reference to his eternal causation, not literally prove the Florentine filioque. I mean, that's pretty serious. Now, let me blow your minds. Oh, You think uh, you're taking Augustine at his word by taking a Florentine interpretation of that passage, but in reality, you're employing an incorrect interpretive methodology. Oh. It sounds like Florence, but it's only because you're presupposing Florence's conclusion from the get-go. So true. Instead of Augustine's own explicit statements that the Father, not the Son, is the principium and octor of the Spirit. If we presume the latter and not the former, we may realize that the Son's role in the Spirit's essential difference is real but not causal. I'm going to repeat. Real but not causal. Now, allow me to explain. We got to make a broader point from on the Trinity. How does one make sense of Augustine's filioque sounding statements, particularly Book 17 and Paragraph 47, which seems to explicitly assign to the Son a role in the Spirit's essential origin? One does not need to guess what Augustine means because Augustine actually illustrates what the Spirit's procession looks like in On the Trinity in quite considerable detail. What I have in mind specifically are his illustrations of the psychological trinities. Mind, love, knowledge, lover, love, beloved, mind, will, and vision. In the preceding illustrations, the origin, principium, octor is the first item, like the mind or the lover. The second item, love or will, is the spirit, which proceeds from the father towards the desired end. The end is knowledge, beloved, vision, the son. This is not complicated if one follows any of the illustrations. All right, so we're going to cover the one, only one psychological trinity in detail, and that's going to be mind, will, vision. In review, mind is the father, will is the spirit, vision is the son. I chose this one because in book 11 of On the Trinity, I find Augustine's illustration to be the easiest to follow for the average reader. Now, in summary, for the mind to have a vision, according to Augustine, it must have the will to look. A mind without apprehension of vision is not truly a mind. Augustine even says that blind people must have vision in potential. So a mind without vision is not a mind, and a mind without a will to have a vision is likewise not a mind. Nor can vision exist without the will to look. So even though will and vision originate respectively from the mind, they don't do so in an identical manner, nor can the mind eternally exist without them existing or would not be a mind. Now, take a look at the nifty picture. It's going to help you understand what Augustine means. Now, in reference to pneumatology, the significance of all the proceeding is the eternal existence of each element despite their mutually respective origination. you got to put on your thinking caps, guys. This is why the Father is unoriginated, the Son is begotten, and the Spirit proceeded. 
The origin must be different for their existence to be eternal and contingent upon one another. For Wait. Did you just hear what I heard? Mm, no. I'm good. What do you mean? For their existence to be eternal and contingent upon one another. For the proceeding, read the entire book, book 11. He just said that their existence is contingent upon one another. Yeah, he's referring to simply the analogy here. Yeah, yeah, but but he's here. Hold on, let's let's go back a little bit. The origin must be different for their existence to be eternal and contingent upon one another. Okay. For the proceeding, read the entire book, book eleven. But paragraphs two, six, and nine, in particular, if you're really lazy. Yeah, he's he's speaking about in in reference to what Augustine speaks about in his book, which is reference to the persons yeah i heard eternal too that's interesting I'm just yeah even it's a mistake yeah i'm not really gonna i mean we all know the issue of saying that there's contingency in god but since we're only responding to the filioque part i mean really is important right yeah we'll just let it slide i mean yeah. Kirk's not a theologian by any chance. Yeah. there was never a time there was the father and no son or he would not be the father and never the father without the spirit because God is spirit. So there's a mutual contingency. Yeah. This contingency yeah, you see, you see. <laughs> is key to Augustine's thought. In fact, taken literally. Contingency is key to Augustine's thought. What the heck? What is he saying? <laughs> what in the world is he saying? That is contrary to Augustine's thought. I mean. <laughs> He literally just to avoid accidents and contingency, God affirms this or counters this by to his understanding of absolute divine simplicity. This is just a very weird view. This is sure. the weird, like, this is actually maybe we're, maybe we're misunderstanding. Maybe he, he really doesn't mean that. Maybe he's really just referring to analogy, but yeah, yeah, so far, yeah, it seems true. like he's yikes. Speaking about the person, yeah, when the mind wills to have a vision. In a real sense, the will precedes the vision. You probably never thought of that before. Taken in isolation, which would be incorrect, in some sense, the spirit precedes the sun causally. Yet until the will is manifested and rests in the vision, it is not fully a will. In other words, until the spirit's procession from the father rests in the sun, the procession is not completed there by making the role of the sun in the procession real, but not causal, right? To quote Augustine, therefore, we can neither call the will, let me uh, change the slide, all right? We can neither call the will the quasi-offspring of vision since will existed before vision, nor the quasi-parent since that vision was not formed and expressed from the will. Perhaps we can rightly call vision the end and rest of the will. There can be no question made about showing that the end of the will is the vision, for the will is manifest on the Trinity Book 11, paragraphs 9 to 10. So perhaps Augustine thought this because, one, he recognized the Spirit precedes the Son in transubstantiating the bread and wine to his flesh and blood. You can read about that in Book 3, paragraph 10. This is liturgically called the Paraclesis. And two, the scriptural teaching that the Son was conceived by the Spirit. In other words, there are temporal references to Christ's origination in his humanity that are contingent upon the presence of the Spirit. And perhaps, keywords perhaps, this has some ramifications upon eternal realities, but this is highly speculative. Whatever the reason Augustine had, the logic of the psychological trinity six bounds compels us to understand, to quote him at the beginning of On the Trinity, book 15. I would say that by mutual contingency, he meant like in ref in referring to ad extra, but he said mutual contingency, which is the issue because the Holy Spirit wasn't uh, incarnated. Um, so even the even to say mutual contingency still poses an issue. Right. Fifteen, paragraph forty-seven. All right, so we're gonna go to the next slide. The will, spirit, proceed proceeds from the human mind, the Father first in order that may be sought, which, when found, i.e. the vision, may be called offspring, the son, which offspring being already brought forth or born, that will is made perfect, resting in its end. 
All right, it's Augustine on the Trinity, Book 15, paragraph. I'm waiting for him to bring up the, uh, the uh, love analogy. 47. As one can see, the very paragraph that contains the strongest Florentine sounding language in all of Augustine's works is premised by the assumption that the Spirit, in some way, the quote Augustine, proceeds first. Now, I, even Augustine doesn't like this chronological language, by the way. None of this is causal. What he's speaking about are these kind of interpretive priorities within the Trinity. Logical. Yeah. So in some way, the spirit proceeds first preceding the son's generation. In other words, Augustine, by employing specific metaphors and explaining the chronological sequence consistently, clearly intends that his words concerning the essential origin of the spirit to follow the precise schema delineated in book 11. All right. So in book 11, Augustine expounds a tritological theology of mutual contingency, not the father and son being the sole cause, the spirit, as Florence delineates. According to Augustine, the spirit's essential origin is dependent upon the son's generation and vice versa. That's why neither are the cause of the other. What? The origin of both the son and the spirit in this. Did you just hear what he said? Yeah, down there, man. I guess I shouldn't give him a shit, though. This is disgusting. Yeah, this is just. Wow. Not, but again, I'm I'm not surprised. I mean, the heck is he arguing? <laughs> I don't even know, dude. At this point, I'm this very guy, I'm very disappointed. This guy just said, uh, Duong had his own theological presuppositions and ran with it, dude. What is he? He's going off a single analogy of Augustine, which Augustine himself admits is insufficient, and is literally running with it to claim that there's a mutual contingency or dependency between the Son and the Spirit. What am I hearing? Wow. I mean, if you read, like, any portion of Deitra Natate, St. Augustine again and again uh, denies the idea that God's contingent in any sense or that the persons are contingent on each other. I mean, that that, that, that was one of the major things in which he, ar he argued against, if anything. Um, no father believes that God goes from potentiality to actuality. And even if you want to say, well, hey, you know, he's speaking of dependency. Even if we speak of dependency, the fathers don't speak of dependency in God. It's still false to say that the persons, quote unquote, depend on each other. Uh, we, we simply say that, that the father is the principle. And since it's through communication of the essence, therefore, no, no dependency is inquired. Because the essence doesn't entail dependency whatsoever. So since the essence d doesn't uh, entail dependency whatsoever, and the and the persons proceed by the communication of essence, then therefore the the processions don't entail dependency. So as I mean, if we just want to use Augustine's analogy, why not use a clear analogy of Augustine? For example, the analogy in which Augustine says that the father and son are basically united by communal love, and by this communal love bring forth the Holy Spirit as a gift. I mean, does he want to bring up that one, which clearly doesn't delineate what he's saying in that analogy? Yeah, like I said, I'm I'm waiting for him to bring up the love analogy. The love analogy literally just collapses everything he just said. But I mean, to be honest with you, I, I'm pretty sure he's gonna avoid it, if anything. So here's the here's chapter five, uh, I mean book five, chapter eleven of Augustine's uh, the Trinitate. Here's what he says concerning the Holy Spirit being the communal, the love and gift of both the Father and the Son. So he says this quote: <clears throat> When we say, therefore, the gift of the giver and the giver of the gift, we speak in both cases relatively in reciprocal reference. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is a certain unutterable communion of the Father and the Son. And on that account, perhaps, he is so called because the same name is suitable to both the Father and Son. For he himself is called especially that which they are called in common, because both the Father is Spirit and the Son is a Spirit. Both the Father is holy and so is the Son holy. In order, therefore, that the communion of both may be signified from a name which is suitable to both, that the Holy Spirit is called the gift of both the Father and the Son. So he's, he's pretty clear. And he's speaking more specifically of the eternal relation also. 
Yeah, this is this is honestly a very dishonest response. I mean, the psychological not only not only that, but the psychological analogy entails that the persons are identical to the same substance as well, which is not uh, affirmed. But how do you then go into eternal manifestation? I don't understand how he then reads Augustine. That's like the first thing he read, Tractate Ninety Nine, where Augustine affirms absolute mind supposedly, and he then talks about some type of eternal manifestation. Mm. That's that's also incoherent. I don't know how he would reconcile that. Uh, he would have to first oppose Augustine's view on absolute divine simplicity, but he hasn't done that. He hasn't contest that. He even concedes it in the beginning of his first quote, Augustine. He yeah. said, he literally reason, he says, would you agree with Augustine or not? He believes that. Remember that? Yep, he said knowledge, life, etc. He said he he said it where Augustine said that they're identical to God's substance, like it was nothing. It's such a odd argument to use from here. <laughs> Let's see what else he says. This system is still the Father alone. It seems that too many ignore the significance of what it means for the Spirit to proceed from the Father and rest in the Son as this is precisely what Augustine means by it. Oh. Now, it helps <laughs> to know that St. John Damascus likewise applies such thinking directly to the Spirit's eternal origin. All right, to quote Exposition Orthodox Faith, Book 1, Chapter 8, St. John says, We believe also in one Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and rests in the Son. Now, mm -hmm. The Emocene obviously understood the proceeding to indicate the Spirit's eternal cause is solely the Father. We so, uh, I think this is the time where we bring up the Serion. Certainly. I mean, as the Greeks, I the acquaintances of Mark of Ephesus understood in the Florentine decree Latino Celli, not only Bessarion, but also even Genadius Scolarius who continued in his uh, orthodoxy and unfortunately reputed it Florence later on, he himself recognized that the term Aisyan could be understood as an underived principle or a principle without a principle. And that's how they understood it. And this is also the same exposition St. Robert Bellamine notes in his defense of the Theoclea. Also importantly, why should we understand when Damascene says the Holy Spirit rests in the Son, that this cannot be understood in a special way? For why else would the Holy Spirit rest in the Son if it's not to be understood that he's some way united to the Son? And how is he united to the Son if it's not by communication of essence? Not to mention even the works of St. Pope Gregory the Great, in which he taught the procession of the Holy Spirit from both the Father and the Son, was interpreted or translated rather in the Greek to be rested in the sun, demonstrating that the procession from both can be understood also in that sense, as it was by the Greeks. It's also very, uh, another interesting part about specifically Damascene in reference to speaking about the procession in his dialogue against the Nietzscheans, he, he says, I say that God is always father, having his word always coming from himself and through the word, having a spirit proceed from him. Now, people will probably say that this procession could be energetic or it could be economic, but then we see what the Greek word for proceed he uses. He uses ek pro, I am not, I, I completely butchered it, but I suck at pronouncing Greek <laughs> uh, terminology. But this is actually the same Greek word which was used at the Council of Nicaea, in reference of the spirit proceeding from the father which is a procession that the eastern orthodox recognizes hypostatic or is a procession that the eastern orthodox recognizes as through communication of essence which the council of black Rene, uh, denies very explicitly so it seems here that that damascene is speaking in reference to the hypostatic procession just like how uh, nicaea uses the same exact greek word to mean a hypostatic procession as well. And we also uh, say that this is an issue because in Scripture itself, in, Re in Revelation uh, chapter 22, it, it uses the same word 
in reference or procession um, of the Holy Spirit from the Son. It, it uses the same exact word, the same hypostatic uh, connotation. But again, Craig didn't watch Duong's video whatsoever because not only does he address this particularly, he also addresses this uh, this quote or when the Greek fathers used the word cause. Um, Bessarion uh, wrote a very good uh, treatise on, on this issue. And what Bessarion said, I'm, I'm going to quote him very, very uh, explicitly. He says, but if the teacher, i.e. Maximus, says he does not make the son, but the father, to be the son's cause, you would not be surprised if you would bear in mind the Greek language and what it is that this language customarily means when it employs the word cause. For plainly, it is the initial and primary cause and fountain root of each thing which it is chiefly called its cause, and that only the Father exists as such a cause. But who would dispute? So again, the Florentines concede with this passage in Damascene, because the Greeks in mind, when they use the word cause, is sp specifically speaking about principum, what we were reading earlier, pr principum of the whole deity. Florentine, as we said earlier, corresponds with the quote, and it doesn't contradict St. Augustine. So I'm not sure why Craig is bringing up this quote from, from Damascene. Um, I mean, it, it really doesn't address anything, and especially when he brings up Damascene saying it rests uh rest i mean it, it really doesn't doesn't add any substance to the argument really mm -hmm. do you have anything to add jungle nope All right, let's go. we speak also of the spirit of the sun says the dynasty not as through proceeding from him but as proceeding through him from the father for the father alone is cause. So not as proceeding from him, but as proceeding through him from the Father. For the Father alone is cause. All right. So resting in the Son is what Damascene means by proceeding through the Son. That's an exposition book one, chapter 12. Yeah. Now it should yeah, not surprise there. us. Yeah, that once again just supports what I was saying earlier, right? That the reason why he says this spirit rests in the Son is because the spirit is united to the Son by procession. This is why, once again, after he says the Holy Spirit proceeds from Father through the Son, he just says the Spirit rests in the Son. Why does he rest in the Son? Or why does he say that principally and he does not rest in the Father? Clearly, theologically here, he's trying to get at this, the Spirit's procession from or through the Son. Nor, also, notice how Damison here doesn't even qualify that this is econom economic or even energetic. He uses the same term by which he proceeds from the Father, I subsistent, to also be in reference to how he proceeds through the Son. Why should we then understand this procession, this term, to be used differently when it's through the Son? Exactly. And that's all. Very explicit. But due to Augustine anticipating the logic of Damascene, he likewise taught that the Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. In reference to the psychological trinity of mind, vision, will, again, mind being the father, vision being um, the son, and... Did he just... Again, like, this literally shows that he has no grasp on the psychological analogy. This attention, i.e. will, is the act of the mind alone. How is, in any way does this entail that the spirit proceeds from the father alone if you actually grasp anything from the psycho the the psychological analogy that doesn't entail that whatsoever the will is the act of god's knowledge of himself alone correct this doesn't entail that he proceeds from the father alone because if you actually read his love analogy he further explicates and says that since god's knowledge of himself and the concept of his knowledge love each other then this entails that a uh or saint augustine also calls the spirit will a will is uh quote unquote proceeding 
and therefore proceeds from the Father and the Son. He, he literally says that that follows, that, that if the, the love analogy is true, then therefore uh, the uh, Spirit proceeds from both. But again, this guy hasn't really read St. Augustine, and the fractions that he did read St. Augustine is this private interpretation, as he says in reference to Duan. Will, being the Spirit, Augustine asserts, this attention, the will, is the act of the mind alone. The word alone, solius in the Latin. It's on the Trinity Book 11, paragraph 2. So in summary, Augustine taught two types of filioques. A temporal one in reference to mankind, usually called an energetic procession, and an eternal one, but in reference to a contingency shared between the Son and the Spirit. The Spirit's procession require, requiring the Son's generation and the Son's generation requiring the Spirit's procession. Neither of these are the doctrine in Florence, and so Zwang and other popular Roman Catholic and even Orthodox treatments of Augustine are wrong. Augustine's pneumatology Whoa. is Orthodox. <laughs> he just claimed all Orthodox treatments are wrong. Dude, that's hilarious. And so Zwang and other popular Roman Catholic and even Orthodox treatments of Augustine are wrong. This guy is a one-man army. <laughs> I guess all scholars on this issue are just wrong. Very funny. Damien, I think we should stop here. <laughs> this is just hilarious. Oh my goodness. You may have to do this in three parts. Anyways, um, I'm gonna go. And so it's very uh embarrassing for Craig. I don't even know what to say. He left me speechless. Wait, wait. Oh, uh, was my mic muted? Yeah, you were. Oh my goodness. Anyways, what what I was saying when my mic wasn't muted is that. <sighs> Uh, we're we're gonna cut uh this live into five sections. The first one, well, which is this part, will be on addressing Saint Augustine, uh, his part of Saint Augustine. Which honestly, I'm very disappointed. I am extremely disappointed on his response to Saint Augustine. But how can you refute something which is so explicit? And 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 this shows. Um, but essentially, I, I guess he's kind of like, uh, the the. It's like like sent on some type of mission by God because everyone else is wrong. Even the Orthodox are wrong. And supposedly only Craig Truglia is right in his interpretation of St. Augustine. And where and where did that take him? That that took him to very Irenaeus interpretations. That led really on to believing Augustine thought there's contingency and the two yeah, personalities. Yeah. Like what Craig's trying to say, Augustine's view is not even the Orthodox view. There's no type of mutual contingency. <laughs> yeah, <Just> yeah. <laughs> not even the the Eastern Orthodox should also be very disappointed right now. Craig Truglia, Christian Orthodox theologies, a lot a lot of who you people look up to just said that in God there's mutual contingency. That's Arian. That's literally Arianism. That's, That's Arianism. Arianism. That entails. You guys want to know what, what mutual contingency entails? Mutual contingency entails that the Son and the Holy Spirit are creatures. Craig Truglia affirmed heresy in his video of, quote-unquote, responding to heresy. What is going on? <laughs> like, what is going on? I guess that's what denying the Fayoko leads to. At least to heresy. <laughs> leads to Nestorianism. It leads to literally, yeah, that you literally think about it. 
Old Harris to the east is through the denial of the Fayokwe. Look at eternal energetic manifestation. It's literally a lower deity entering into creation. Look at this view of uh, Lily of Craig, that the sun and the Holy Spirit are somehow contingent upon each other as if they're creatures. And then also look at like other views in which they say that, oh, well, the Father alone perceives the Holy Spirit. And that this is like a distinct power from the Son, the Spirit. Therefore, making there's two powers now in God, which is really polytheism. Yeah, this is this is very bad. And I'm honestly in part two. I'm I'm very, uh, not not even, like eager is not even the right word. I'm very curious as to how he's gonna respond to Hilary of Poitiers, who was another father that is very explicit. But judging by how he uh, talked about Augustine, I wonder how. I'm very scared of how he's going to talk about Hillary of Poetry. I mean, he was pretty clear with Augustine, in which Augustine said that the Father was the author of the Holy Spirit. So will he now somehow cope around in St. Hillary's use of author, which he conceded last time on Twitter? Was no, he up. actually said that about St. Hillary in, in reference to author. He yeah. actually <laughs> said that St. Hillary's use of author po uh, poses a problem for the Orthodox perspective. He, he literally says that very explicitly in a, in a community post. So <laughs> I wonder what he says about Hillary, but then, so part two will address Hillary. Part three will address St. Athanasius. Part four will address uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria. And part five will address Maximus. And then we're also going to address the letter of Marius as well. Yeah. Okay. God bless everyone. Uh, let's finish the stream. We'll also in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hope you guys enjoyed the stream. Give a like, subscribe, and we're going to do a part two addressing the entirety of Tra uh, Craig Truglio's response. Do, do, do you have anything else, Django? Nope. Can't do. All right, guys. God bless.